Welcome to Strengthen the Numbers. My name is Mitan Patel, analyst, accountant, and aspiring finance leader. And it is my ambition to bring the leaders of business and finance to the table, distilling their careers, experiences, and insights into actions that you can take to your clients, customers, and communities to become their value creator and ultimate trusted advisor. And with that, let's move on to the show. Ben, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Matan. No problem at all. I'm absolutely delighted, Ben. I know that you've also made, you know, Anders' future finance list. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. It's quite the honor and surprise, actually. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I was I was uh, very, very surprised as well. Um, been really positive and um, no, really grateful to, to Anders for this. It certainly helped boost, boost my sort of network. Have you found found the same as well? Yeah, yeah. I've had a lot of people send me, you know, the uh, networking uh, invitations on LinkedIn. So you're finding more people who think like you do. And uh, yeah, nothing but good, good things on my end. Brilliant, brilliant. Cool. So, you know, look, really excited, generally excited to have you on. You know, when I looked into your background, you've done some incredible things in, in a, you know, in a relatively short space of time. Really want to try and delve in there and um, find out more about you, what you've learned and um, I know you do bits and pieces on the, on the side as well, which I'm really interested to to explore, and especially the sort of uh, Six Sigma um, element that that you're you know that you're very passionate about. So I think to begin, just you know, it'd be really good to know just a little bit more about your background, where you started, what you've learned, and then just um, yeah, to to where you are now. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, you're right. I do have a unique background and some unique strengths, and uh, more than happy to share my story. Uh, I think I have a thoughtful plan of what I'm doing, but we're going to find out here if I do or not. So, so I graduated in, with my bachelor's in accounting and finance in 2012 from uh, Rutgers University in uh, New Jersey here in the States. And I went into New DuPont into their finance field program, which was a rotational program to give you different exposure to different areas. Uh, when I went into DuPont, I thought, great, you know, I'll be here for the, for the rest of my life because I thought that's how things worked. Uh, but I've definitely learned from then. Uh, so, so DuPont, I had a pretty good experience. I was there for three years. And during that time, I learned cost accounting. I had the chance to work on an SAP project. And I had a chance to help with the Camor spinoff. So during that time, you know, I learned the ropes of your entry level position, what to do, what not to do. And I also had the chance to complete my CPA, the certified public accountant, and also the CMA, which is the certified management accountant. And then there was a project that everyone does who's entry level there that allowed me to also earn my Six Sigma green belt. T tell me more about the, the project. It, what I did is I looked at a certain plant to understand why we're having errors come into certain cost centers at the month end close process. And working with the plant contact that I had, we were able to discover that we were properly encoding certain freight charges from one module into SAP. So we did some testing and we found out that by coding things a very specific way, we were able to reduce 99 to 100% of these errors. And then the cool thing is from that is that I went to the leadership of these, of all of the, uh, the plant accountants. And I said, I think we should expand this to not just my plant, but all the plants We're all facing the same issue. And management was uh, supportive. They let me pull together a project team and roll this out for all the plants in North America, which was a nice project to lead. Yeah. Really good. Um, so, you know, I read one of your LinkedIn posts. You did talk, though, that there was um, a lot of politics. You got really frustrated about it. And that's what, you know, came from. So tell me more about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I learned firsthand about uh, corporate politics. Uh, <laughs> so so going into the plan, I talked to management about what I wanted to do. They said, great. And, you know, I got to work. But as we, we continue to roll this project out, some of the plant accountants said, Ben, you're not telling me what to do. I'm not changing. So that kind of, uh, that kind of unsettled me. You know, we, we ran into an obstacle and I went to plant management and said, okay, can, we, can you help me work through this? And there was just nothing. 
it was sorted out yourself, which is kind of disheartening. You thought you had leadership support and you didn't, and they didn't want to, they didn't want to create conflicts for themselves. So I'm, I was just uh, sitting there with a dead project where only half the plants had, had in, implemented the improvement and half didn't. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, that's you know, it's not when, when, you, when yeah. you're unable to dry things, you, you know, don't feel, you know, you've got something great and, you, and you're not able to push it through. Um, it's frustrating. I mean, what, what would you, you know, from that experience, have you, you know, have you felt you learned something from it? I mean, how do you apply things differently today? Yeah, yeah, I definitely learned from it. So from... DuPont, I learned about all the great, you know, Six Sigma process improvement tools and methodologies. And that's something I've been able to carry forward. And from this particular lesson, one of the things, you know, if I'm reflecting back on it is in the future, I've been more careful about making sure that I don't just have support from the top. I want to have support from the top, the middle, the bottom, and I want to be able to communicate this and make sure everyone understands what we're going to do and you know and to air their concerns before we begin implementing so you really want complete buy-in if you can get it yeah no absolutely i think uh you know i sympathize with that completely i'm a bit like you i get very enthusiastic about things very passionate yeah um some people buy into it because they love the passion enthusiasm some people don't and you know one thing i have to to work on certainly is being able to bring everyone um together it's a it's a very it's a very sometimes you know when you self reflect it sometimes very challenging and very humbling but also it is the reality and actually that's that's what true leadership's about right it's being being to build that consensus that drives something through that passion will get you you know intelligence passion great ideas will get you you know 70 percent of the way there but to get that 100 percent definitely get that that sort of buy no that's it's really interesting. So, so tell me more then about your your career beyond uh, beyond dew point then sure sure so i had that project you know kind of wrap up you know, it was what it was. And I saw some other things at DuPont that I wasn't crazy about. They were really struggling and they wound up merging with uh, Dow Chemical. And, uh, you know, I had done the CPA, which they love, but they didn't really understand the CMA. So for my career, I wanted someone who could understand and appreciate my background and skills. And Johnson & Johnson is one of the companies that's a huge uh, supporter of the CMA certification. You know, they get it. And they had this really great cost accountant role open, open up in the city of Wilmington here in Delaware. And I was a perfect fit for it because of my education, you know, and my uh, enthusiasm. They liked me, I liked them, and I went to work for them. So here I was at Johnson & Johnson now thinking, great, this will be my career until I retire. <laughs> um, uh, I, I've had a history of being one step ahead of these, these divestitures or sellouts. So I'm at Johnson & Johnson for a year, and they announced that they're going to sell off our company to a private equity firm. Right, okay. So, so I, I was patient with it. I said, let's see how this settles. And it turned out that they saw me as Ben, the cost accountant today, and Ben, the cost accountant tomorrow. You know, I raised my hand for different things, threw some ideas their way, but at the end of the day, it's stay in your lane. And yep. to me, again, a little bit disheartened, you know, I, I know what I'm passionate about and what I want to do. And I knew it wasn't going to happen here at uh, the company that was now called Naramco. I was looking to leave Naramco and there's this company called Shire Pharmaceuticals. And they were bringing a lot of work back to the U.S. They're doing a reverse outsourcing of work to Costa Rica. And that was exciting. They were bringing 70 people uh, worth of work back to the U.S., so they brought me on and they, they transitioned that work here. And it was really apparent really quickly that this work was grueling and tedious and very manual. Yeah. And uh, so at Shire, what I was able to do is I was able to find ways to redesign my work and automate it and then to teach other people the same skills and lead training sessions. And I did that. That was my role for about a year. And for the last six months, I had another team approach me, ask me to work with them to work on their standard cost. And I had a, a good time working on projects to improve their processes, uh, which really speaks to my skill set. So standard cost, mm -hmm. process improvement, that's me. Uh, so at the end of the Shire experience, that, that kind of wound up because 
Shire started to struggle with their business. It was clear that something was going to happen. Either they're going to be acquired or something, something good wasn't going to happen. And, and my team over in our location, we were two analysts and one manager. And we knew that the rest of the team was over in Chicago and Boston. So again, this wasn't somewhere where my career was going to flourish due to the location and the time. And uh, I could see that if I want my career to grow here, I, I had to move on. And then fortunately uh, for me, I had some time to complete my MBA here at Shire at the end of uh, 2017. So, so again, I'm looking, I'm hungry for growth. And <laughs> a recruiter reaches out to me about a company called South Mill. And South Mill was a family-owned mushroom farm. And they were, they've been business for 50 years. But a few months before I joined them, they, they were... They were now 70% controlled by private equity firm. And the story was that they were ready to grow up and make some big changes. Uh, so this was a compelling story for me. You know, I can improve processes. I can do standard costs and for the first time for them. Uh, I saw a big upshot here. Uh, but, but once I got into the company, things were a little bit different than they described. So this role was, to say at least, challenging uh, in good ways and bad ways. And while I was there, I had a chance to do a few really interesting things. For the first time, I created their uh, standard cost model. I helped them to also optimize the way that they were working and thinking. And that was, that was again, what I love doing. So yeah. I was only at South Mill for six months, but while I was there, I had a recruiter approach me about my current job. And the story that they sold for the company I'm at, Saventia, was so compelling that I really couldn't say no. Cool. And it, and it seems like you found your, your sweet spot with the with Saventia then. Yeah. Yeah. So at Saventia, the, C, the CFO, who's my boss, he said to me, he hired me for my mindset. You know, and I love that. He sees that yeah. I'm someone who challenges the status quo, and they want that person in the room with them. So I'm there, I'm hired to challenge things, improve things, and to do a lot of business partnering. And if I could write my own role, that's what it would be. So I'm really enjoying my time at Saventure right now. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. But one thing that comes up, and it's a fair question, and I think it's uh, worth asking you because you've actually written an article about it and the benefits of it is the question of drop hopping. Oh, yeah. um, so you've written actually about how drop hopping could be a good thing. Mm -hmm. I suppose for those that haven't read it, what would you, you know, what would you say very briefly are the benefits of, you know, considering hiring someone who's job hop? Sure. I think job hopping is a very good way to earn a ton of experience in a short amount of time. To me, I think of it as consulting without the travel aspect. Um, and, so what, yeah, so I've gone to different companies. I've seen how they all handle very similar problems in different ways. And to me, that's been one of the most valuable things too. So yeah, let me, let me you know, I hear what you say, uh, but let me, let me put the challenge to you then. If I'm a hiring manager and I see some of your CV, I can see you're quite clearly incredibly intelligent. Uh, you clearly learn and pick things fast, uh, up fast. You've got a lot of different skills that you apply in a lot of different environments. This is great. But I could just hire a contractor or I could just hire a consultant yeah, and, and, and do that. Why would I hire someone like yourself instead then? Sure. So the benefit of hiring someone who's a job hopper is that they come in with the, the knowledge and ability to quickly jump into a role and to start adding value very quickly. Someone who, who's not a job hopper might take a longer time to get the speed or as you said, a contractor can do the job, but there's no future for it. But a job hopper is someone who can come into the role, and if it's the right place for them and it's the right culture, they're going to grow with the company. So they're going to yeah. they're going to quickly learn their role and improve it, and they're going to want to learn different areas and help improve those other areas as well. You know, they they've seen different things. All the, a lot of companies, what we do is we face the same problems, but we think that they're unique to us. And having someone who's a job hopper, they can add a lot more insight, I feel, than someone who's an employee who's only seen one company their entire life. Yeah, no, but look, if, if I had my own sort of thoughts that as well, I, and again, I'm a bit biased because I've got a similar sort of profile, is that I completely agree. So could hire someone who's, um, you know, who's stable, 
but what someone like yourself could definitely add is a lot of different skills apply it very quickly and actually you get a lot of return on the salary that you pay and the other thing that was critical and i think it's really important to highlight is that uh, with job hoppers it's not that they they go somewhere and go right within the year i'm absolutely going to leave it's they 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 go to a role and they go right i want to do a lot of stuff and i want to keep growing that role and i want to i want to own that role and keep progressing with the company i don't want to be sort of be left behind and i think that's a really important thing right yeah yeah i i think too that someone who's a job hopper is going to be less risk adverse they'll be more comfortable saying things that are uncomfortable but true you know if you're a contractor it's not really your business you're paid to do one thing and you do it if you're a long-term employee you don't want to create some risk that's going to haunt you in a few years you know if you're a job hopper you have conviction in what you know you want to voice your opinions right or wrong and then have those discussions and i think i think that's a lot of the value that that employers are going to see you know, very, very interesting discussion. I think actually with the way that the job market's changing and, and especially in finance as well, the nature of it, I think that's going to become more and more prevalent. And the challenge for um, hiring managers is how do we capture those sort of people but allow them to grow with the company? Mm-hmm. Uh, but all, I suppose also to balance it against those that don't necessarily have that same mindset but and make them also feel valued, right? How do you, like I suppose like a general man- leadership challenge, how do you ensure that everyone with different objects and different ambitions feels valued and rewarded and gets the opportunities that they want um, from it. So yeah, no, no, de- definitely very um, interesting. So, you know, segueing a little bit out, um, you know, from all your experiences, what, what sort of stands out from you? Is there one that stands out? I, I would say no, I think it's a cumulative effect. And just the big theme that I've seen, I, I said it earlier, is that how many, it's surprising how many companies face the same issue, but, they think that they're unique. If you if you see the same problem a lot of different ways, I think it being able to have those insights is really going to help your career. You're right. It's, it's all the different experiences that builds up, and I suppose it's all the sort of miniature standout moments that all come together to get you to where where you are and potentially allow you to grow to go further. And I think one of one of the things that you know I really want to discuss, and I think you know I really want to sort of highlight was the Six Sigma bit. Yeah, so sure. I understand that you did that you uh, you know you done a course on on Udemy. So yeah, tell us tell us a little bit about sort of your involvement with Six Sigma. So as I mentioned earlier at Dupont, I did a Six Sigma training. And I thought that was really interesting. And what I like about Six Sigma is that it gives employees the mentality to think about how they should be doing things differently and to have those discussions. So for me, you know, continuous improvements a way of life. Uh, so, so anything along those, line, along those lines is really going to speak to me. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, I, I've actually very interested in Six Sigma myself. I've I've um, read a lot about it. I haven't done a certification yet, and I've not got involved in the project. But um, I think, yeah, you're right. The the Cartesia Prune part, the way of looking at things, process mapping, all those great things that Six Sigma is involved with. It's very useful, not just for a finance professionals. I think all all people that do any sort of uh, head office job, I think it, it's really important. I suppose one thing I did did recognize though about Six Sigma is in fact there's two things one it can get very technical with statistical elements and two if you look at the companies that have seen be seen as innovators of Six Sigma so you know your General Electrics uh, Motorola's etc etc you look at them now and actually a lot of them are are struggling right they're failing yeah, to adapt absolutely. to this sort of new age so I mean what's you know to, to, to people who say actually Six Sigma is outdated or it's not really worth learning or it's too technical what, what would you say to them? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right on the, you know, statistical analysis comment. Statistics is intimidating. You need to have a certain subset of knowledge. You need to have certain tools. You you need to know how to do certain graphs. It's a lot of hassle for not much output. Uh, And for me, I, I ignore the statistical component of it. And from my perspective as well, if you're only looking for a problem that has a certain data set that's going to work with your statistic model, you might only look at certain problems and not you know, others that are a little imperfect for your, your model and purposes, which is a little you know, counterintuitive. And yeah. then also from taking statistics courses, I know that you're allowed to remove what you call data outliers to get certain results that you want. So you yeah. may be able to have your data and, and to show certain outcomes that may not be reality. So if we can take statistics out of the picture, I think Six Sigma has a lot of really good tools that we can use. And and, it, and, it, and in terms of the second question of terms of the companies that were pioneers and now have, you know, 
now a failing. Yeah, yeah. Like you said in the news, there's been stories about the companies in the US here, 3M, DuPont, Motorola, GE, all of these companies used to have huge uh, departments full of Six Sigma people. And for me, I think there are several reasons of why these companies have really had struggles recently. Uh, the first thing is that a lot of these Six Sigma programs are very heavy at the top instead of at the bottom. Uh, so, it, you know, it's managers telling employees how to do things without first, you know, asking employees for their insights and to understand their limitations. Uh, the second part with having a top heavy approach is that your fixed costs that you have to pass every year with cost saving improvements is a huge hurdle. You know, if you have a manager and three professionals, you can see a salary of 500,000 a year and getting 500,000 savings a year is, that's a challenge. I don't know if someone's going to pass that. So you, you're, you're just creating hurdles for yourself. And then I've noticed too that Six Sigma projects, especially with the statistics pieces, they're very bureaucratic and you need very regimented documentation and there's an approval process. I think that this just puts too many people off. If we give people on the floor, the operators, the linemen, you know, the, these tools, they'll be more empowered and engaged in their jobs. And I think that's the right way to do it. Yeah, duh. I think, yeah, it's very interesting because if you look at the, you know, one of the big things now, right from software to general project management is the the sort of agile methodology and the different uh, subsets within that. And a lot of it, you know, or say one of the key principles is, is less on documentation, whereas Six Sigma, a, a key component of it is about documentation. Actually, you know, um, nowadays it's, yeah, I think the idea of documentation is important, but not, not in such a regimented way. So... How have you applied it then without, without that sort of statistical element? There's a project that I did at Shire. And uh, yeah, let me just walk you through the steps of what, that, what a project looks and feels like. Sound good? Brilliant. Yeah, it sounds good. Sure. So we had this process where it was for intercompany invoice processing. So each week I would receive a file with invoice summaries. Uh, and the process was to then take that Excel sheet, you manipulate it into a very specific format, then you upload that file into a, you know, a web-based tool, that web-based tool would export your calculations. You then take those calculations, you copy them into another workbook, and then you complete the journal entry. Just for me describing it, I'm sure you're thinking, wow, that's a really, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a <laughs> process. And, you know, that, that was me at my job. So, so let me talk about what I, what I did on this one. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> so the first thing I did was I took the processes as it was, and I completed it in the original state. I wanted to understand exactly how things were now and how they worked. So we didn't have any you know, misconceptions. Uh, and then I, I, of course, measured how long this process took me. So two hours, two hours every week. And then I also you know, documented some of the things that I thought that we could improve. You know, for one, there's, there's many steps that are specific to format and that can throw the process off. You know, I had concerns about what was really happening in this tool. How were the calculations working? So that was step one. You do the original process, you make some notes and you measure. Uh, the second thing I did was I chose a documentation tool to help me create a visual for this process. I, mean, I, I use the high level process map, which is a little bit easier to use if you're new to you know, Six Sigma tools. And what this did is it created a diagram that showed the relationship between all the inputs, the outputs, the people involved, and all the systems involved. So I had this diagram now, and as you might imagine, it was quite cumbersome showing things that were just looping around. The next thing I did is I went and I asked questions. I asked questions to the people that used to do this process. I, I want to know if there's a certain reason of why we're doing the process this way. Is there a reason it's overly complicated? And the answers I found out was no. They just had this web tool they like to use, and that's what they did. And it's important to ask those questions because if there was a reason and you redid the process, that would be a huge error. And the next thing I did was I wanted to understand exactly how all the calculations were working. So I did some testing with this web tool to recreate the calculations in Excel. Once I understood what was happening, I was able to go to the next step. 
So what I did was identify what the inefficiency, if inefficiencies may be, you know, the excess, excess of time form I spent formatting and moving data around versus having all the calculations done in one workbook. And then, uh, so I, I have the project scoped out, it's measured, it's defined. And then the next thing I did is I created a diagram that showed what the efficient future state might be. And to me, what I want to do is take this data, you pop it in one workbook, and you have all the calculations performed with clear transparency, and the output is produced in the same workbook. And then uh, what I wanted to do after that, since it's a rules-based process, is very you know defined steps, I want to use VBA to automate the entire thing. So I want to take this thing down from 10 steps to two, push a button. So that was my end goal. What I did at this point was that I approached my coworker and I got their thoughts and feedback on it. And I brought up my manager, you know, and both of them said, wow, this is a great idea, go for it. So you need to, you need to have other people involved. You can't work in a silo and you, you might miss something if you do. And then after that, the next step was just getting to work step by step, you know, put, put the whole thing together and then you test it. And then in the, in the final steps of this project, I, I ran the process the old way, I ran the new way, I produced the same results, but in the end, when I did the final measurements, the process took five minutes versus two hours. And so that was, that was how I approached these types of things. Wow. Okay. No, that's incredible. Um, you know, I've done something not quite through Six Sigma, but I suppose utilizing the same methodology to automate one of my colleagues at the, one of the month end processes, which was really good. And yeah, the power of VBA is, is incredible on that. So yeah, if you have the ability to map it out and then have the tools to be able to actually implement the mapping, you're looking, uh, you're looking pretty good. So I suppose for our audience then who have no experience at Six Sigma, who might be relatively new to this, or who've tried things before, but not you know, it's not really worked out for them. Are you able to very briefly sort of, you know, a guide to how they might go ahead to firstly learn it and secondly then try and apply it? Yeah, sure. So if someone came to me tomorrow and said, I want to learn Six Sigma and work on a project, my first a bit of advice that I'd give is to take a quick online course or to do what I do and spend, and spend a few hours Googling the questions that you have. So you understand what Six Sigma is, what it's for, what it's not for, and what all the tools are that are at your disposal. So first step that I'd advocate for is awareness. And then after that, I would work with your team to write down some ideas uh, that you wanna work on. You know, you wanna capture what, what are good problems that are gonna yield a lot of benefit, you know, easy things first, and then work your way up to more complex and difficult issues. Uh, so you work with your team, you identify a few easy projects, and then after that, you want to, to review all the tools that Six Sigma offers and try to identify three to five that are you're going to adopt, understand, and know how to use. So, so you know now what projects you're go gonna work on, you know what tools you're gonna use, and then the next thing that I would advocate for is that you would have discussion to understand precisely who is responsible for helping you know, your team with Six Sigma training, who's going to review, approve, and validate projects, and what this whole process will look like. You know, if you don't assign someone to do it, then no one's going to do it. And then once you have that in place, you can, um, you can get to work. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very interesting. So look, we're coming close to the end of the podcast. Was there anything else that you wanted to talk about that we, we haven't had the chance to discuss? Yeah, as we talked about earlier, I had created a Udemy course that highlights everything I've learned about process improvement. So on my own, over the last few years, I've done a ton of different, uh, I've, I've read a lot, I've had interviews with people, I've had a lot of different exposure to all sorts of things, process improvement and Six Sigma. So I realized I had this great wealth of resources and I wanted to you know, help brand myself more as a process improvement person. And I thought that this would be a great way to do it. So what Udemy is, is you, you create your own course layout, you create your own content, 
and you create you know, video segments of yourself teaching the material, and then students can take quizzes and complete assignments to show that they're also learning with you. Congratulations on that. Well done. I'm truly, really good. So look, um, uh, any any other resources you'd recommend to our to our listeners? Sure. So this one's a little off key, but this is one of those things I just swear by, you know, almost right next to the Bible. The name of the book is The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, you can use your imagination <laughs> to fill out what the last bit might be. Uh, and this is by Mark Manson, who's one of my favorite authors. And what this book is about is how to focus on the things that matter and to not focus on the things that don't and to understand what the difference between the two is. And it just, after reading it and thinking about it, it just helps give you so much clarity in your personal work life. So I highly recommend no, it. Brilliant. No, brilliant. That's certainly one of the more interesting uh, titles. I think that's been mentioned as a sort of recommended, um, you know, <laughs> recommended <laughs> resource, but oh, look, it's, it's interesting. I think, is, is it one of those, just out of interest, is this one of those that uh, has a controversial title but actually is not particularly controversial inside? It, it's like a traditional book. It's just phrased in a very different way. Or is it, is it... Inside and out. It's, uh, it's pretty oh, okay. Brilliant. Um, look, um, and how, how do people, you know, get in touch with you? So my LinkedIn is the best resource to find me. Uh, if you send me a request, I almost always accept, unless you're trying to sell me a <laughs> scam. That's some of those, yeah. Ultimately... <laughs> I'm on Twitter, but I have no idea what Twitter's for, so LinkedIn it is. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Okay, yeah, we'll certainly post a link uh, to you, right? Well, look, Ben, it's been incredibly fun. Lots of great stuff that you, you've talked about, and I think a lot that people of all, all levels, and actually I think backgrounds can learn a lot from. Um, certainly I've I've learned a huge amount, um, and as I said, it's been fun doing it as well. So look, Ben, thanks for being on the Strength and Numbers show. Yeah, sure, Tom. Thanks for having me. I uh, had a good time. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. When all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers. 